Whether you're a DBA or a developer, chances are you've had to do some performance troubleshooting using execution plans. For most of us, we didn't get a formal introduction or education to execution plans. It was more along the lines of, I've got problems, I'll look on the internet. The internet says, check out the execution plan, and we'll go from there. And along the way, we looked at things like missing index requests and which operators had the highest cost. But apart from that, we weren't too interested in other details, like what operators we were looking at or how estimates were created. In this chapter, we're going to get a more formal walkthrough of all the parts of an execution plan. Along the way, we'll talk about several topics. We'll talk about the steps that go into formulating an execution plan how SQL Server optimizes an execution plan, the different levels of optimization that can happen with an execution plan, and finally, the factors that go into building an accurate and effective execution plan. Broadly speaking, there are three steps that go into the creation of an execution plan. Those steps are parse, bind, and optimize. Now, because I have children, and because the execution plan is often likened to a map, I can't help but get this Dora the Explorer theme out of my head. So I apologize with what I'm about to do to you, but here goes. Parse, bind, optimize! Parse, bind, optimize! <laughs> I'm sorry, I just had to. Anyway, let's look at the three steps individually. During the parsing step, SQL Server will do a couple of things. Number one, it will check to make sure that the language that you've passed it is syntactically valid, that you didn't misspell select or gorp by or inner johnny, things like that. Another thing that it'll do is it will build a tree, a logical tree of the things that you want it to do based on, well, you know, it might be easier if I draw this on your screen. Is that okay? I promise I'll clean it. Okay, cool. So SQL Server will get past what is a select, a from, a join, a where clause, things like that. These all get built out into a tree, sort of a rough sketch of the execution plan. And it looks something like this. If we were to tell it we want to select from table A and select from table B, and we need to join those two together, then it'll decide there's a join there. And if we have a where clause, we'll filter on the where clause. And finally, we'll do a select. That wasn't so bad, was it? I'll clean it, don't worry. You can try this for yourself in Management Studio. Write three queries. The first one has a totally valid syntax. The second has a totally valid syntax but uses table names that don't exist. And then the third one uses invalid syntax. And see what happens when you hit the parse button. There's the proof that the parsing step really only has to do with whether or not you've spelled all your keywords correctly and they're in the right order, as opposed to whether or not objects really exist at this point. Step two is called the binding step. This is the step where SQL Server begins to care about whether or not the stuff you're trying to reference is valid. It takes the tree that it mapped out earlier and begins to connect those to real life objects. If those objects don't exist in SQL Server, it gets mad about that. Other things that it gets upset about include whether or not the user has permission to access or read from the objects that you're trying to reference in the query, as well as whether or not your group by statement might be valid. If you miss a column in the group by that's in your select and you have aggregates, this is the step where it's going to complain about that too. The third and final step is the optimization step. 
This is where SQL Server takes the parsed and fully validated tree and turns it into an actual execution plan. During the optimization phase, there are a number of important decisions that SQL Server has to make about what to use in the execution plan. And the operators that you see represented in the final plan are decided upon during this phase. During the optimization process, the optimizer will go through three distinct steps. The first step is simplification. It will decide if there are any ways that it can take the query you've given it and rewrite it, rearrange it in such a way that it will make executing that plan easier to do. Let's say we've got a query that has three tables, table A, table B, and table C, and that we're selecting from A, interjoin B to A, and interjoin C to A. And because there's really no difference in how we apply these, these are both the intersections of those two tables, whether it's A to B or A to C, SQL Server may look at that plan and say, all right, well, it's written in such a way that the join to B comes first, but will I get fewer rows overall to deal with if I join to C before I join to B? It's this kind of rewrite, this sort of exploration of alternative join orders that the optimizer will undergo during this process. Another thing that happens is called view expansion. A view expansion simply means that SQL Server, instead of going to a materialized indexed view, that is, all the rows are stored, it can go to the underlying tables for that view and perhaps use indexes that are related to those tables rather than having to use the view and only the view. Sometimes it's more efficient to use the underlying tables and their indexes than it is to use the materialized view. Unless you've told SQL Server specifically that it cannot use the underlying tables in order to make up the query plan, then it will choose the best route, either through the materialized view or through the tables beneath. Another thing the optimizer will do is it will recognize if something that you're selecting in your query matches the definition of a computed column. Let's say, for example, that we've got a column that has the date diff between creation date and last activity date. If SQL Server figures out that you are selecting that exact same thing, it will say, hey, I've got that in a computed column already. There's no reason for me to go through the trouble of calculating all that stuff all over again. One more thing that the optimizer may do is it may search for contradictions in your code. For example, if you've got a series of tables interjoined together, and at one point you say you want the post type ID equals two, and then later on in your where clause you say where post type ID is not equal to two, the optimizer will figure out that these two things are just completely at odds with each other, and it's going to result in no rows returned. Again, the whole process of simplification is just to make sure that the query is easier to optimize. The next phase in optimization is figuring out whether or not the plan is a trivial plan. Trivial plans are just plans that are so low cost that it's not worth the extra effort to figure out if there's a more efficient way of getting the job done. A good real life analog for this is thinking about making signs. Let's say that we want to make a garage sale sign and it's about eight by 10 and doesn't have to be anything fancy. If that's the requirement and we're trying to optimize the making of a garage sale sign, we're not gonna think about it very hard. We're just gonna take a piece of paper, a marker, and write garage sale on it. Good enough. We're not going to try to make it more efficient. We're not gonna think of multiple ways to make a sign as long as we know that that's all we have to do is make a garage sale sign. The same is true of SQL Server's optimizer. If we pass it a query that is ridiculously simple and low cost, it'll say, you know what? Exploring alternative ways of getting this query done are not gonna be worth it to me, so I'm just gonna take the first idea that I've got about how to execute this, and I'm gonna run with it. What you end up with then is called a trivial plan, a plan that it was the first thing SQL Server thought of, it was good enough, and it just went with it. When a trivial plan is created, a few things happen. Number one, it skips over the cost-based optimizer meaning that this plan will not go parallel because there's no cost being equated to it, and so it can't be compared against the cost threshold for parallelism. Because there's no cost, no cost threshold can be met, it'll be serial. 
Another thing that happens is that missing index requests are not generated, which makes sense. If you've already got a plan that is so cheap and so easy to figure out, why bother working hard to make it faster if it's already fast enough? And then finally, the last thing that can happen is your statement may be auto-parameterized. When SQL Server goes through the trouble of making this trivial plan, which is not much trouble, it says, you know what, this was so easy, I'm just gonna keep this one on standby, it's not gonna take up much room. So that way, if this statement gets passed in again, I'll just grab this plan that I've got sitting here waiting to be reused. In order to do that, it's going to take literal values like say last editor user ID equals 41071 and parameterize it and turn it into last editor user ID equals at P1. Not every statement is optimizable. There are some plans that are so trivial, which we've already talked about, that there's really just one way of going about putting them together. But if a plan is more complicated and it can be optimized, then the optimizer will decide to go through additional passes through the process. When this happens, it will continually evaluate whether or not the work that it's putting in is worth the improvement that it will get out in finding a better plan. But if we're talking about a cost-based optimizer, something that is concerned about making queries inexpensive, what makes up the price tag on that query? Well, it's made up of six different factors. CPU, projected disk IO, memory requirements, statistics, the number of rows affected, and the indexes that are available. All of these numbers are put together in a way that we don't get to see to come up with a cost number. If after a pass through the optimization process, that cost number is low enough relative to the amount of time that the optimizer took to put that plan together, then it'll be happy and ship it off to be executed. If it's not, it will undergo another round of optimization and more complex rules will be applied in order to make that plan less expensive. 